So, if those of you who are here this morning uh, remember one of the points of our presentation, we'll wait till everyone gets their papers. Okay. Okay. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. You'll see there's two sets of prayers. One says prayer power, and on the other side of the same sheet it says during japa. And the other one is Sri Nama Mala Grahana Mantra. Now these are highly recommended prayers that we offer to our chanting beads before we begin our chanting each day. So, in order to access more mercy, Is there enough? Okay. Do you have one? Yeah, okay. Okay. Everyone, did everyone get a, two sheets of two different prayers? We run short? Hmm? We ran a little short? Okay, what we'll do is we'll, we'll photocopy a few more. There's some extra ones here. Okay. And um, if you all remember this morning when we made our presentation on the Harinam Chintanamani, there was one slide within the presentation that uh, was somewhat fundamental to the success of our chanting, or the success of what we say attentive chanting. Attentive chanting is chanting. Inattentive chanting is an attempt at chanting. There's a difference. We remember that one verse that we read that one, if one is not chanting attentively, one can chant 300,000 names or 60 or what we say three lakhs of names every day and get absolutely no taste. <laughs> So we go back to the point of how important it is to access that attention in our chanting. Now here, it also mentioned that in that presentation this morning, there was one slide. And it's mentioned here on, if you look on your prayer things on the sheet, it says prayer power. And it's the one by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And it's not a prayer of humility, it's a prayer of reality. <laughs> it's done in a mood of humility, but the reality is the nature of this point. And he says, <clears throat> he's praying, he's praying to the, the great souls. And we pray to Bhaktivinoda Thakur because he is also a great soul. O Vaishnav Thakur, I, alone I have no strength to chant the holy names of the Lord, of Lord Hari. I have no, and this is not like some just statement of submission, humility. Hum, no, we don't have any. We can't, we don't have the strength to do it. I beg you, therefore, please be merciful and with a particle of faith, give me the treasure of the holy name of Krishna. So this this is fundamental, and actually this prayer was was uh, shown to me by His Holiness Sachinandana Maharaj. He sent it to me, and we were discussing it. That it, it comes down to the fact that no one can chant attentively unless they pray for attentive chanting. <laughs> 
And that's not enough, of course, but that's at least what is necessary for success. So in these prayers, and we can say these prayers before our japa, or on the other side that there is prayers during your japa. You might say, why will I have to break up my japa? These prayers are not meant to break up your japa. It's when your, prayer, when your japa is already broken due to the roving mind or some symptom of inattention. You use these prayers to get you back to attention. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're more like the lifesaver to get us out of the illusion of that we're actually chanting when we're not. <laughs> it's, and of course, these are of course are highly recommended prayers. But I'd like to um, just read the prayer from the Pancharachrikri Pradipa, <clears throat> which I personally found <clears throat> is complete. It says, I am by nature the eternal servant of Krishna. So that's a very powerful point. We hear that all the time. We have to understand that that's who we are. <laughs> Whatever else we identify is simply in association with the material energy and having a material body. So that means that these things that we accept as our self or the things that we own in relationship to these identities in this material world are what is called moha. Moha means illusion. And the, the verse is janasa moha iyam maham meiti. I in mind is the, uh, is the greatest form of illusion in this material world. And there's two aspects to it. I am this body, and these things that are in relationship to me are mine. My family, my possessions, mine. So these things come by way of living in this world, and coming living in this world means that we got a body. <laughs> if you don't have a body, you don't have only any of these illusions. <laughs> so when you get a body, you start off your process of becoming bewildered. <laughs> and then you compound that process by living in this world, by establishing relationships based on this body, friends, family, uh, various types of social, political, familial uh, connections. And we identify that as me or the reality of our existence. So how do you live and at the same time in the reality and function in the illusion? <laughs> so the beginning of this prayer says, I, I am by nature the eternal servant of Krishna. So it, when you read a prayer, what it does, or even when you give a lecture, those who give lectures, you start off with something very profound. And then from there you expand on the profundity by explaining different angles of that profundity. And then he says, because of my bad fortune. <laughs> so nobody likes to think that they're, they have bad fortune. But Prabhupada said, because we're in the material world, we're all criminals. <laughs> But then, you know, because you look around and you think, man, there's so many criminals, so it's not so bad. <laughs> but we don't identify ourselves as being criminals because this material world is a jail. It's a jail for the soul. And what is, you get a, when you go to jail, you get a uniform. So different color uniforms and different stripes in different places. And sometimes if you're really bad, they chain a ball onto your leg so you can't walk around so easily. So we got this uniform, it's called my body. <laughs> That's your jail uniform. <laughs> and then you have a, a German body or you have a Croatian uniform, you have an American uniform, Slovenian uniform, Indian uniform. You think, oh, Indian uniform, it's a better uniform than the rest of them. <laughs> But still, it's a uniform. <laughs> so in these uh, 
what we say cell of the material uh, jail. We get a uniform, and we get uh, what we can. We get various types of food rations, and that keeps us going, believing that the jail is not so bad. <laughs> But people in the jail think that the people who are outside of the jail are in prison. Because, you know, the votees are actually, they're on parole. <laughs> they're on parole. Parole means that you've been, you served your sentence and you're now, you're just, re you're doing, you have to check in every once in a while. And sooner or later that'll be done and then you get out and you're free. So those who are being paroled, that's us. We're in the parole line. Uh, we have to somehow or other realize that uh, to take this parole pr process very seriously and not go back to the jail. <laughs> so here, because of my bad fortune, I have been inimical towards Krishna from time immemorial. Wow, I've been inimical towards God? No, that's not me. I like God. He's a nice guy. In fact, he's, he's one of my best friends. But the fact that you're here is, this, is, this statement proves your identity. In other words, because we're in the material world, and Prabhupada used to say, very few souls actually come to the material world. The majority of the souls in existence, and of course we can't calculate that, there's no number, if you were to start writing a number on a highway that would connect all around the world and put numbers all the way from one to another all around the world, you still wouldn't come up with the number of souls in existence. There's no number. And so, as Krishna is unlimited, the little jivas are also unlimited. But in that unlimited number of jivas, only a tiny particle of that number come to the material world. And that number is also so vast that we can't calculate that number. So that's us. We're the major minority. The majority of souls never leave Krishna because they have realized that their position in relationship to Krishna. So why, no, identifying with my body, I have been continually wandering in the cycle of birth and death in the material world, suffering the threefold burning miseries. It says, not just miseries, but those miseries are burned. Adiatmic, adibaltic, adidaivic, miseries of the body, miseries of the mind, miseries of other living beings, miseries of higher powers, Miseries of personal servants, that's another thing. <laughs> that's called adidasika. <laughs> misery, misery of personal. That's, a, that's an inside joke. <laughs> and maybe some of you will experience it eventually. <laughs> anyway. But there's different various, different kinds of miseries. And uh, because of that, we are suffering mitri maya ravese kachu habu bubu bhai chief krishna das e vishwas kale nara dukanai wandering from karana guna sangoso sadasa joni janmisu sometimes as a demigod sometimes as an insect sometimes as a an animal, sometimes as a human being, going from the three realms of existence, seven, 14 planetary systems, three realms, higher, middle, and lower, life after life. How many births? It actually says that the soul in the material world is called Nityabhara. Now, if you actually analyze the terminology, it doesn't make sense. If you call the souls in this world nityabhada, you're saying something that is contrary to the soul. But that's what the Shastras say. Why does it call it nityabhada? Nitya means eternal, and nitya and bhada means conditioned. Is the soul eternally conditioned? No. But the soul in this world is called nityabhada. Why does it say that? Because it says, the reason why it says, no one can search out how long we've been in this material world. It's not possible. 
We've been in this material world so long that it's not possible to understand how many millions of lives we've been in this world. Because there's 8,400,000 species of life. Generally, the living entity traverses from one species of life. And finally, when they get to the human form of life, they have what is called the first class cell. <laughs> I mean, there's third class cells, second class cells, first class cells. And in the first class cell, there's, there's privileged privilege prisoners who get to use the law library and they get an extra sandwich on Sunday. <laughs> In other words, they get a little bit extra. So, you know, those who have some material opulence or success are considered to be good prisoners or privileged prisoners. But everyone is a prisoner, shackled by this material energy. So no one can trace out. Now, here, this is the most important part of this whole prayer. As a result of some unimaginable good fortune, and now Madhurya Kandambini makes this discussion, goes into a large discussion, Vishwanar Chakravarti Thakur says, how can we understand that we have become fortunate enough to receive the opportunity to engage in bhakti? Bhakti is independent, bhakti is causeless, how has it come upon me? Is it because of pious activities? No. Is it because of uh, something that is m my good fortune, but I can't understand it? No. It sounds like that in this particular prayer. It gives many reasons. How have I come to the process of devotional service? Is it somehow Krishna chose me and he just wants me to have it? No, it's not even that. What is it? It is the mercy of Krishna's representative. That's all. That's my good fortune. Because he wants to give it to everyone, I have somehow been fortunate enough to receive it. So the mercy of the pure devotee, empowered spiritual master, representative of the Supreme Lord, who acts on the desire of the Lord, gives that mercy to those. Now, he's giving that mercy to everyone. But how many of you are taking it? So where, where is my good fortune amongst the fact that he's giving it, he's, he's canvassing everywhere. What is it? Boro duke koro ga boro duke kore duke mo what is that song tsura bi kunde che na mera kure che kora nitai kora nitai boro suke kabogai yeah boro suke kabogai he's going everywhere and canvassing here please take this Maha Mantra, please take this opportunity to attain eternal happiness. This is what you've been looking for. And how many people take it? Very, very few. And how many people who, after they take it, stay with it to perfection? Very, very few. <laughs> because it's a very rare and very valuable gem. Why? Because Krishna is the greatest of all gifts. When Prabhupada started Krishna Consciousness in uh, 26 Second Avenue, he was looking for a place to set up his programs. The devotees who were, we couldn't even call them devotees, they were hippies who were somehow got attracted to Prabhupada, found a storefront. And it was an old curio shop that used to sell little trinkets, knickknacks, and unusual items that people don't usually buy in, different, in, in the ordinary markets. And uh, the name of the place was Matchless Gifts. Maybe you've been to that place in New York. Matchless Gifts. It's a little tiny storefront. It's, it's so narrow. It's about as narrow as from that pole to here. And it's long, just like, it's just like that. It's just long and narrow. It's a storefront. Prabhupada had his Vyasa son and 
and devotees would come through the door and just sit. And would, of course, there was not too many places to sit. And uh, when Prabhupada wanted the, to renovate it and make it look more like a temple, the devotees started to take down the old sign that was advertising the curio shop, which was matchless gifts. Prabhupada said, no, this is a perfect name for what we are giving. That gift that it cannot be matched. And what is that? Krishna. <laughs> Krishna. That is the rarest and most valuable jewel to get Krishna. Therefore, bhakti is the only means to capture Krishna. There's no other way. There's bhakta, there's bhakti, and there's Bhagavan, who is Krishna. So when bhakta has bhakti, he captures Bhagavan. <laughs> so well, who's more powerful than Krishna? Bhakti. Bhakti can capture Krishna, nothing else. And that bhakti has to be Sudha bhakti, <laughs> or pure devotion, which is represented by Srimati Radharani. So therefore we pray to Srimati Radharani for her mercy, in order for us to execute devotional service in such a way that we can please Krishna by our service. So the, so the prayer goes on. As a result of some unimaginable good fortune, I have attained the mercy of my spiritual master, and now I know that I am the eternal servant of Krishna. So now we know who we are. If you say, I'm not this body, that doesn't tell you enough. It just tells you who you're not. It's like saying you're a nobody. <laughs> you're a nobody. I know, but what am I? <laughs> you are something other than the body you inhabit. Do you have any relationship with this body? No. You create it, that's all. We create the relationship, that's all. But due to our attachments to the things in this world. So that creation is also an illusion, and the body that we have is the basis of that created illusion. That's all. Do you like this lecture? It's, it's okay? Okay. It's getting down to the essence. Because when you know who you are, and then anything that happens to you in this material world is inconsequential because it doesn't happen to you. It happens to your body. It's a fact. When we get sick, we don't get sick. The soul is never sick. The soul is never hungry. The soul is always, what we say, atmarama. That means self-satisfied. So what happens to the body doesn't happen to us. But still, we live in the body. Therefore, the body is important because it's our house. If somebody comes and starts breaking your house, you would stop them or maybe call some authorities to arrest them. So in the same way, we take care of the body because we live in it. This is where we hang out, <laughs> inside this material body. But when we see other people, all we should see is that there are different, different types of houses, you know. There's the different races, different cultures, different genders, like that. All that is is different, what we say, different kinds of dwellings for the soul, that's all. But the tendency of the conditioned soul is to identify with and relate with the other living beings based on what kind of body we have. Now that's not completely wrong because there's an etiquette that allows us to transcend the body when we behave in the right way along on, on, based on the bodily distinctions. It doesn't, doesn't like you say, oh my dear tiger, you are a spirit soul, let me embrace you. The tiger will say, hmm, lunch. <laughs> So you, you, even though that tiger is, a, you know, is non-different than you, and his, he's not his body either, you still observe a certain etiquette which is comparable to existence and understanding our position in relationship to everything. Mm -hmm. But we, ha amongst all this, what we say, external 
there is a reality, and the reality is we are Krishna's eternal servant. <laughs> and we belong to Krishna. Okay, so it goes on. Here, I am an infinitesimal spiritual being completely, completely apart from the gross and subtle body. So it goes on. I have obtained the good fortune of serving the lotus feet of my spiritual master, Sri Guru. Guru is called Sri. Sri means decorated with all transcendental qualities. Under his order, I am following in the footsteps to serve the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the name of your worshipful deity, Sri Sri Radha Madan Mohan, Sri Sri Radha London Ishwara. Shri Sri Radha Gokulananda. So this prayer, I find very uh, edifying and very, it just helps me to focus my attention on who I am while I am chanting, I'm not this body. I'm Krishna's soul. I'm trying to connect with Krishna based on my, my real identity. So that prayer is more like a, a medium of connection. It helps us to establish our, what we say, the fundamental principle of sambandha. Sambandha means relationship. Krishna consciousness has three aspects, sambandha, abhideya, prayojana. You can't get, you can't perform abhideya unless you are fixed in sambandha. What does that mean? Abhideya means the things we do in devotional service. Chanting, reading, serving, worshipping. All the activities that make up bhakti. That's called abhideya. But sambandha means the relationship. What is the understanding of relationship based on the activities we perform. So unless that is clear in terms of the relationship, we will not be able to perform Abhideya properly. And therefore the goal, which is Prayojana, which is love of God, doesn't manifest. <laughs> so therefore, when you go through the Shastras, all the scriptures, the most profuse of all the topics is sambandha, relationships. What is my relationship with the other devotees? What is my relationship with the material world? What is my relationship with my spiritual master? What is my relationship with the different levels of devotees? What is my relationship with so many different categories of living entities and different forms of activity? When we have that clear, then Abhideya manifests nicely. And through, through Sambandha, Abhideya manifests nicely. And what happens? One develops the qualities of a Vaishnav. In other words, those qualities that are conducive to the execution of devotional service. Without Sambandha, that those qualities don't really develop because the principal quality within this relationship is is that it's service but it's service with humility not just service we can serve but it's not really service unless it's done with the desire to please and unless it's done with the desire to please it cannot really actually satisfy the soul because if Krishna is not pleased then we get what is called freedom from material miseries but we don't really get Krishna. So many of us are fixed in devotional service because we have the material miseries have been wiped away. And that comes as soon as you engage in devotional service. Those things, but that's a byproduct, and it's not even considerable. Devotees don't even care about material miseries because these th these things just automatically glow as soon as you enter into the process of bhakti. But we want to go higher, and when we want to develop those qualities that are conducive to loving relationships with Krishna and with Krishna's devotees, 
these are the foundations. So these prayers are these are these are prayers of sambanda, understanding our connection with ourselves. We have to know who we are so we can connect with ourselves like that. Otherwise, if we forget who we are and we act on the material platform and we try to perform bhakti, it's more like karma. It's more like karma. It's not really bhakti. It may look like bhakti. Karma yoga and bhakti yoga look exactly the same. And Krishna speaks about both of these yogas in the Bhagavad Gita. He speaks a lot about karma yoga. Well, karma yoga me really means that it's about you, but you're trying to fulfill your own desires in relationship to Krishna, and at the same time you're giving something to Krishna in that activity. But it's still me-centered. Therefore, it's not bhakti. It looks like bhakti. Only what bhakti manifests in its form when one performs the activity for the pleasure of the Lord or for the pleasure of the Lord's devotees. Then bhakti starts to manifest. <clears throat> so although it's called bhakti, it's not pure bhakti. And sometimes when we hear when we hear activities that are mentioned as bhakti but are not pure bhakti, it's simply concessionary. It's not giving us the clear understanding, but it gives you an element that you're in the right place with the wrong consciousness. <laughs> you're in the right place with the wrong mood. So having the right mood and being in the right place is actually bhakti. <laughs> so bhakti means to please Krishna. Ayabila Sita Sunya, Jnana Kaman and Avritam, Anukulena Krishna Silanam, Bhakti Uttama. We want to please Krishna. And we want to please the spiritual master who is Krishna's representative. We want to please the Lord by fulfilling the Lord's desire by giving Krishna consciousness to others. So these are different ways to see how we are pro approaching. So these are prayers of Sambandha, but they're also prayers to help reinforce or reawaken our real identity. Here, this next prayer is coming from the Srimad Bhagavatam 1124. O oh my Lord, O oh Supreme Personality of Godhead, when will I be able, when will I, I again be able to serve your eternal servants. So the word again is mentioned there. That means at one time we were with Krishna in the spiritual world, serving all his servants while serving him at the same time. We did it before. We don't remember. Because coming to the material world means you forget. We have done that in full, pure, transcendental consciousness. And will, will I again be able to serve your eternal self and find shelter only at your lotus feet? O Lord of my life, may I again become their servant so that my mind always thinks of your transcendental attributes. My words always glorify those attributes and my body always engages in the loving service of your Lordship. So here... It's somewhat revolutionary to life, wanting to be a servant. The material world is master-oriented. People will do service in order to become the master. <laughs> in other words, if I can get people to serve me in either my mind or on the physical level, then my success in life is being achieved. <laughs> But a devotee thinks, my success is how much I can serve. The more I can serve, and the more I can serve Krishna and his devotees, the more I am in the position to, to actually connect with Krishna in, in pure loving service. Mm -hmm. we, it, it's not a problem we say, I want to serve Krishna. It's not a problem, right? That's easy to understand, but I want to serve 
everyone else in relationship to Krishna. That's hard sometimes. Because sometimes we might think, these people are not worthy of my service. <laughs> but therefore, if one has to understand there's different ways to express service to different types of living entities who are in different bodies with different types of mentalities. So, there are three categories. There are those who are greater than us, there's those who are equal to us, and there, there's those who are in a lesser position. So, it, is, it says that by serving those greater to you, serving those equal to you, and serving those greater, lesser to you, is an expression of love to Krishna. You want to love Krishna? Serve these three categories of living entities. How do you serve them? For those who are greater than us, you hear from them and you offer personal service. Those who are equal to you, you make friends, you share Krishna consciousness together. Those who are lesser, you show compassion, you give them a chance to come up and become more and more connected with devotional life. So the last one is called doya. Doya means compassion. Reaching down to pull up. In the material world, people also have these connections with these three different categories of people, but they express it in a different way. Those who are greater than us, we feel envious towards them. This is the material can. Now, this is not for devotees, but this is how the material world works. If someone is greater than them, then you can consider that person a competitor or someone you want to overshadow. And sometimes when you have the same occupation or the same lifestyle, you want to destroy that person just to be in a better position. And this is called envy. So it's natural to envy people in the material world that are greater than you. You might eulogize that person or maybe glorify that person. Why? Because you're thinking, uh, I would like to be like that also. <laughs> Or sometimes we think, why should they have it? Let me have it. <laughs> now on the equal level, when people are on the equal level in the material world, what is their characteristics? They're always telling their friends that how wonderful they are. <laughs> they brag about their own glories, their achievements, their characteristics. They want to impress their friends with whatever is considered impressionable by them. And those on the lower level, if someone's lesser than you, you feel good. <laughs> you feel good. <laughs> and that person's suffering more than I am. It's not so bad here. <laughs> or at the same time, you deride them because maybe they haven't developed the same amount of qualities that you have. So you deride them, keep them down, press them down, find different ways to uh, vilify them or criticize them. And that goes on in the material world all the time. People criticize people in lesser positions, lesser pecuniary positions, lesser, lesser familiar positions, lesser political positions, lesser, lesser, whatever lesser is a, as an opportunity to deride that person. <laughs> so, but in the spiritual, it's the opposite. So Prabhupada writes in the purport, describing these three categories, if one follows this principle of honoring and serving those who are greater, making friends and serving those who are equal, and uh, showing compassion to those who are in a lesser position, one will never experience the miseries of the material world. <laughs> no, even iota of misery will ever come upon them. Why? Because they're in the right consciousness. They don't draw miseries to them. They, in fact, miseries can't come because they are loving Krishna by honoring those who are greater. They are loving Krishna by serving and, uh, and making friends with those who are equal. They are loving Krishna by showing compassion and raising up those who are in a lesser position. So this is, this is, the, this is the purport of the verse that this is the way to love Krishna. 
Sometimes we say, I have no love for Krishna. How? This is how you can show your love for Krishna. By acting within these three categories. Jai, you got a haircut. Okay. You still left a lot on there. <laughs> you must have had attachment on top of the... You know. <laughs> On, on the machine there. Attachment means attachment, you know. <laughs> well, it looks good. It's it's okay. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very nice. It looks very nice. You look effulgent. <laughs> Prabhupada said, our sh when we come shaven head, it looks like we're coming from Vaikuntha. <laughs> they say, we have to shave you and save you. <laughs> It goes together. Yeah, it's like, like, ladies, you're lucky you don't have to go through this. Jai Sisi Panchatatva Ki Jai. Okay, so again, back to these prayers. So these prayers, and in the beginning, I kind of eliminated the first part. But it says, before beginning your japa, remember your Guru Dev, Srila Prabhupada, and the end of Siplic Succession and offer prayers to them. So what is that prayer that we can offer? Om Agyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Sva Padantikam Bande Ham Shiguro Shiguta Padekamalam Shigurun Vaishnavam Scha Shi Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragana Tam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahita Krishna Jaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Brindavane Swari Vrikavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kampa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Paebhacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhaktavin Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And when we actually understand what we're saying, we're actually offering our prayers and respects and glorifications to our spiritual master, to all the spiritual masters, to Radharani, to Krishna and his different manifestations of qualities and characteristics, to Lalita, to Vishaka, to Rupa Goswami, to all the six Goswamis, to Vanchakalpa, to Rubhischa, means to all the great souls. So these prayers are complete. So we were, if we were to recite these prayers, just that section, what we just did, we do that before class, before your japa, that is a, a, a complete prayer to all aspects of the transcendence, the guru, the Krishna, to Krishna, and to the previous acharyas, and to the internal energy of the Lord, and to the manifestation of the Lord in his form as Sri Panchatattva. So that's a nice way to begin in japa. And then, then you begin after, and then you can also offer other prayers. Now, if you look on your other sheet, the second sheet that we have, you'll see this is a quite a unique prayer that is not so much known, even in within Vaishnav circles. And what is it's called Sri Nama Mala Grahana Mantra. These are prayers to the beads. So our our Japa beads are actually. Krishna and 108 gopis. One time, Srila Prabhupada saw 
someone's japa beads hanging on a nail somewhere in the temple. And there's a nail and the beads were hanging. Prabhupada said, the gopis are crying. <laughs> That's what he said. You don't put your ba beads in a, on a nail. He said that. Your go the gopis are crying. Because those beads are... The hundred and eight principal gopis. And there's, there's, of course, there's one principal. There's two principal gopis, and that is Radharani and Chandravali. And amongst those two, Radharani is the best. And then there's the eight principal gopis. And then there's the Astasakis. And they're different than the eight principal gopis. And then those who are prominent within the different ganas. Ganas means group, group of gopis. Those personalities such as Raghunath Das Goswami, who's Rati Manjari, Rupa Goswami, who's Rupa Manjari, these are prominent gopis. Kamala Manjari, who's Bhakti Vinoda Thakur, Kusturi Manjari, who is uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. So these are principal gopis that have manifest themselves in this material world to assist the Lord in his pastimes. So these gopis, the principal gopis, make up the the first 108 and that's what we have for our japa beads that's what we have for our job some people will say well why 108 well 108 principal gopis like that so therefore we're offering prayers to these to krishna who is the the connecting bead we don't chant on that of course we know that and we chant on the gopis like that because they're shaktis, they're energy. And we're offering our prayer to Krishna, ultimately. So these prayers here, you'll see that it's a series of six prayers. They're beautiful prayers. And it starts off by glorifying Sri Krishna, who is the son of Nanda. And it says, his form is bent in three places. He's called Tribanga Hare Krishna. His hands bend over the holes of his flute. Now just imagine this. Just visualize this. Here's Krishna. And he's in his threefold bending form. He's like he's in a curved position like that. He stands like that. That's his transcendental form. And it attracts the hearts and minds of everyone. His form is bent in three places. His hand is bent. His hands are bent over the holes of his flute. The son of Maharaj stands resplendent amidst the circles of gopis. So, he's Krishna is the main bead. No, he's surrounded by all the gopis, the other beads. O Mala, the second prayer, please destroy inauspiciousness in my chanting of the holy name of the Lord and grant me the position of service to Radha and Krishna. This is all I pray, O Mala. So again, praying to the beads, that one, there is inauspiciousness in my chanting. I mean, we know that through various forms of inattention. Destroy that. And give me the position of service to Sri Sri Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan. A prayer of the heart. The holy name is a beautiful transcendental touchstone. It is the supreme goal. There is nothing higher than the holy name. I therefore worship the holy name. Glorification of the holy name and the ultimate principle of worship. The sacrifice of the holy name is the highest sacrifice which destroys the contamination of Kali Yuga. We hear that verse, Kalir Dosha Nidhi Rajan, Asti Eko Mahagun, Kirtana Evri Krishna Sya, Mukta Sangam Param Bajan. That in this age, it is called an ocean of faults. But that all those faults are destroyed by one great boon. What is that boon? Hare Krishna. <laughs> the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. We had, think about that. You, you might say, well, this material world is so bad. It is. We can see it all the time. And sometimes we even have some uh, personal experience. All that is destroyed by the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. So the sacrifice of the holy name is the highest form of sacrifice, destroys the contamination of Kali, 
And in order to please Lord Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I offer this sacrifice of the holy name. In other words, and it says here, I'm establishing my beads. I'm getting my beads ready for my daily japa. I'm praying to the beads, so I'm also uh, empowering the beads by these, these prayers of mercy, petitioning for mercy to the Supreme Lord. And then, the next prayer, the holy name is the savior of the fallen. And then this is a prayer of submission, a prayer of humility. Oh, please deliver this lowest of among men. Obeisances again and again unto Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, unto Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. We give a lot of attention to Sri Maha, Sri Mahaprabhu. Why? Because he has brought the holy name to this material world for our benefit. So he is the Yuga avatar and he is an incarnation of the holy name himself to deliver the holy name through practicing the holy name and teaching the holy name. So the last prayer, O Mala, amongst all the gods, so now the Mala is referred to as God, you are the consider the bestower of all perfection. By dint of this fact, O oh Mother, so now the, the beads are, become, are come to the point of Mother. Mother means nurture. Mother means heavy. Just like we don't really connect the word heavy with Mother. But what does it mean? Heavy with love. How is that understood? When the Yaksha who was actually Yamaraj in the form of a Yaksha, said to his son, Dharmaraj, what is more heavier than all the mountains on the earth? And Dharma, and, and Yudhisthira was very intelligent. He said, Mother. Mother is the greatest of all personalities in this world. When we honor our mother, just like the scriptures actually say, there are seven mothers, and our personal mother is also one of the seven mothers. The earth is mother. The cow is mother. The wife of the guru is mother. The wife of the leading, the brahmana, brahmaniya, brahmani is mother. The wife of the political head of the state is considered to be mother. And the nurse is also mother. The seven mothers. So those persons are worshipable. They're worshipable. And for devotees, we refer, in the gender category, refer to all women as mother. It's a, it's, it's a term of respect. It's a term of affection, both, like that. And that helps us to keep our consciousness away from the sensual aspect of boy-girl connection. When we see women as mother, like that. And that is culture. That is actually culture. This Western culture, when they asked Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatmaji, what do you think about Western culture? He said, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> what he meant was, yeah, they should become cultured. Yeah. <laughs> There's no culture out there. What is the culture? Culture is make money. The culture is enjoy yourself, right? That's the whole culture, which is a, which is an all culture, not a culture, an all culture. So we're therefore our movement is revolutionary. People sometimes can accept the fact that we are spiritually active persons, but when we see we're trying to change the fundamental principles of their culture, they get a little nervous. <laughs> Because we're actually challenging their whole lifestyle. Everything they, they do is, we're saying it is all sinful, useless. Why? Because it is simply based on uh, the body and the extensions of the body. And then we know when you base that on, you haven't really come to human culture. Human culture starts when one starts to perform pious activities and devotional activities. Then human life actually begins. 
That's why Prabhupada would speak very strongly. But his strong speaking was actually the understanding of what is actually going on in the name of society, that people have not reached human form of life yet. <laughs> so, yeah. So, back to that point. So here, so these are the, these are six prayers. So you can recite these prayers every day before you do your japa. I've been doing it regularly for a while. And I've found, and I can, just, I can give an honest personal tennis testimony, it's not something I'm just saying just to inspire you. I feel more enthusiastic to chant. My enthusiasm to uh, approach my daily japa, 16 rounds, has become increased a lot. It's no more like a drudgery, I have to do it, got to fit it in. No. Now it's become something that I enjoy. <laughs> because by these prayers we can start to feel that there's some mercy coming through these prayers. So it's recommended that we offer these prayers. And of course, the prayer that we always chant and it's being done by devotees everywhere around the world, is the Shikshastakam prayers. And that is also highly recommended to chant those prayers. We do that in the temple here, right? Every morning, it's done. And in most temples around the world. And, and just before Japa. <laughs> just before Japa. Uh, some devotees that I know actually spend more than a half hour 45 minutes offering prayers before they even begin their japa. Uh, I spent about 15, 20 minutes at the most. But, you know, you can... And there are so many prayers. There is another set of prayers called the Namastakam, which are very powerful prayers by Srila Rupa Goswami, glorifying the holy name of the Lord. And uh, there's endless amounts of prayers. So, I chose these prayers because I found these very direct and very helpful. Now, one other thing before we end is that the mind wanders during japa. So, sometimes it gets a little bit out of hand. So, here there's a prayer on the other side of that sheet. It says, O oh fool, you rascal mind. This body is under constant attack from innumerable attachments and disease, and death is certain. What remedial measures have you taken? Just drink the medicine of Krishna's name, which is the cure for all disease. O oh mind, why are you giving up the nectar of Krishna's names to talk about things such as family problems, security, and all? What can I say to you? Just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Radha and Krishna are like two great oceans of mercy. Please be merciful to me. I take shelter of you and surrender unto you. Although I am a sinner and offender, please engage me in your devotional service. So here, these are prayers that one, these are recommended. It's not like you have to chant these prayers. But if you find them useful when your mind is somehow or other continues to wander, or continues to try to solve problems. These are good prayers. So keep those sheets with you. Did any? Is there anyone who didn't get a sheet? There's a few devotees here, uh, and mostly all Slovenian devotees, right? So I'll be here for a few more days. So uh, uh, where's Johnny Kinath? Is he here? No. Is he there? He's hiding? Or maybe Mahatma. Mahatma, just take note of the devotees that didn't get the sheets and we'll we'll make sure we get those sheets to any of the ladies that didn't get any? Okay. So we'll get we'll make sure you get get those prayers also. Uh any questions? <laughs> cool, so you always have a question. That's good. Okay. I knew. Yeah, go ahead. Big mouth. Speak your question, Kusho. Kusho, speak your question. 
So, uh, what just in the Bible, what does Krishna tell us to do? He says, he, what does he tell you to do? Yeah. He says, love me. He says, give your love to me. Stop giving your love to so many other things. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I saw another hand up here somewhere. Okay. Sri Devi. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I was just thinking about the time factor. Um, the whole morning program, the Mangalarti, is designed for us to uh, to d to come to the mode of goodness at least and be still and to chant the holy names nicely. So when we are already, you know, spending about half an hour, forty-five minutes in the Mangalarti, aren't we already praying the Gurvashtakam? We are praying to Lord Nishinga Dev. We are praying to Tulsi Devi, and then of course we may make some personal prayers and then so if we go on to chant all these prayers would it not take at least another hour more no, no it just to chant the prayers on the one side where it says power prayer power and the chant the prayers to the beads takes about 10 minutes so maybe not even that thank you But these are direct. You're actually praying directly for the mercy of the Lord when during your chanting. This is direct. The other prayers are also prayers and are also powerful. But this is, you're making a direct petition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there a question? Yes. Okay. Uh, you recommended in this lecture three sets, three sets of prayers, namely... Uh, Shikshashtakam, Mangala Charana, and these um, prayers to the beats. So how to schedule them after another? What's best? Um, well, s some of us don't have an opportunity to go to the morning program. Some of us live in Krihasta enclaves outside and don't always attend the morning programs. So therefore, they can... Uh, do those prayers in whatever sequence. But I would say prayers to the spiritual masters are first, so the Mangala Charanam would be first, like that. And then prayers to the beads, and then Shikshastika prayers, like that. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, I do it different. I do my Shikshastika prayers while I'm uh, getting ready to chant. In other words, basically when I'm, you know, after I finish showering in the morning and after I put on tea lock, then I get dressed. And while I'm getting dressed, I put on, I chant those prayers while I'm doing things. It's not as attentive as it could be, but I find that I can, you know, I offer, I offer those prayers at that time. So you you know it it's it's not like it's this way or that way. You just find what is convenient for you, what works for you. That's so, all. Yes, do we just go on to? Who's the author of these uh, Nama Mala Grahana prayers? Um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> <coughs> these prayers were given to me. Um. You can, these prayers are found online. You can also go and do a research on the computer. You'll find them. And maybe you can also find the reference there. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I was not able to answer that. Yes. So, for example, when uh, first I started to offer um, some kind of boga for Krishna, uh, I also uh, did it uh, with my own uh, words. And uh, I, I know that these prayers definitely have uh, greater potential than which I can offer, but does it have any uh, value if uh, at first I start to offer my own prayers with my own words? 
Um, Prabhupada said you can you can do both. You can re you have to. He said you should recite notable prayers. I mean, prayers by the great mm -hmm. souls, and you may also offer a personal prayer. Mm -hmm. Your personal prayer should be done with from the heart with sincere uh, with sincerity. You know, not like very perfunctorial. You know, offer it nicely. Yeah. Yeah, Satsrup Maharaj has written a book about prayers. He talks about both of them. If you get that book, he, it's complete. He talks about the whole science of, of approaching prayers and offering prayers. Yeah. Yes, uh, Krishna Premi. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I'm a little bit bewildered. Because uh, only a little. Oh, that's, that's very good. <laughs> when Some we of are us are really bewildered. <laughs> <laughs> when we are coming to the movement, in the beginning everything is blissful just being in Kirtan. And we are in ecstasy. We are, and the process seems very easy in the beginning. And then the more we are study, the more we th uh, these things reveal to us, it, it seems more and more difficult. So and uh, I'm really. Why does it become difficult after when you as you go on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because Where you know. What happened to the bliss? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, then you understand that you don't know what is bhakti actually. You are practicing karma, and you see anarthas, and it seems one like our, one of our uh, senior devotees. Uh, some some we used to have a an understanding. It was also. Um, something that was surmised. In other words, we kind of we said that when you first come, Krishna gives you bliss, then He takes it away, and so you can become now you can become uh, uh, really uh, now you have to work for it. Before He's it's a gift, and then when you come, He get, He makes you work for it. But that was rejected. Mm -mm. So this one senior devotee seemed to come up with a very clear understanding. He says, when we come into Krishna consciousness, everything seems so wonderful. The devotees are wonderful, the atmosphere is wonderful, the prasadam is wonderful, the deities are wonderful, the temple smells wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> and I use that word accordingly, because the word wonderful means wonderful. <laughs> it's a very powerful word. And but then you hang around for a while, and then you start seeing problems here, and this, that, and this, and you start seeing the devotees ordinary. In other words, you start developing a material concept. You keep your material conception as you associate within the, the spiritual realm, and then you ha your consciousness is, has lost that innocence, which allows that bliss to manifest. So you have to come back to that again, where you see every devotee as as wonderful, <laughs> and your husband as wonderful, because <laughs> he's a devotee too. <laughs> Sometimes we think it's a husband, but you know it's a devotee too. <laughs> My wife, she's a devotee. <laughs> My mother, she's a devotee. It's not only these relationships, we have to go beyond that and see their, that, that person's relationship with Krishna. Like that. So, there's a tendency to start seeing things ordinary. It only happens after a while. But, but it doesn't have to happen if you actually develop sambandha. Sambandha means understanding the, the, the essence of each of our relationships like that. Then it's always nice. You're not convinced. <laughs> Difficult. If you cry for Krishna, then it'll, it'll work. <laughs> Her name, her name is Krishna Premi, and pro, you know I got that name because I was reading this account that Krishna Prabhupada was giving initiation, and there was one girl. She was always crying, 
So Prabhupada said, oh, we should give you the name Krishna Premi because it means one who always cries for Krishna. <laughs> so I thought that would be good. <laughs> so if you cry for Krishna, that is really the highest. No, that's, I'm serious. Prabhupada said, you can't get Krishna until you actually can cry for him. <laughs> so you already got a head start. <laughs> it's, it's good. So we should practice crying. This is a crying movement. <laughs> not, not like I'm crying because my chapatis were stolen, no. Not, like, <laughs> not, not that kind of uh, yeah. Any other questions? Hare Krishna. Oh, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, excuse me, but I didn't understand the first uh, verse properly. Could you un uh, explain it, please, again? Or Which verse? Th the first one. The one when we read from the... The prayers to the Pancha, beats. Pancharacha Pradipa. Srinama Mala Grahana Mantra. Yeah, it's a, it's a glorification by visualizing Sri Krishna in his transcendental form playing on the flute. It's a visual prayer. You just visualize Krishna standing in his beautiful three-bow bending form and he's, his fingers are over the flute and he's smiling and he's very enthusiastically playing the flute and he's surrounded by a whole circle of beautiful gopis. <laughs> It's a vision. It's a meditation. And the flute represents the beads or the gopis? Well, the gopis, it says here, amidst the circle of gopis. I just, I superimpose that analogy because I was thinking, you know, beads are gopis and Krishna is the main bead. So he's encircled by the gopis. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's a wonderful book about um, um, crying for Krishna is the title of a book. And um, it's very good um, before you start to chant. It's actually prayers, like a poem, like a poetry. Mm. It's uh, uh, from one um, lady, Kanchanavali. Oh, Kanchanavali, my she's, sister. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's she's a powerful personality. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a disciple. Maybe it's the other Kanchanavali who is a disciple of Shiva Ramaraj. Yeah. That's who, yeah. That book is powerful. Mm. Oh, that is real. You, if you get that, yeah, you'll, you'll, you're, you're like in a, you're like surrounded by onions. You're just crying all, just crying all the time. <laughs> Sorry for the jokes. <laughs> Yeah, that is a... I mean, when that book came out, devotees were getting that book like, you know, like it was getting sold out everywhere. That's an amazing book. I forgot all about that book. I used to read that book every day. For weeks and weeks and weeks I was reading that book. It's called Crying for Krishna, right? Yes. Yeah, it's really a beautiful book. Yeah, and it's for the men too. <laughs> Me cry? Not me, man. <laughs> Not me. I never cry. <laughs> I'm strong. <laughs> no, it's these 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 tears are the price of getting Krishna. Okay, I think the devotees have been really spontaneously engaged in so many service today. I'm surprised you're all so alert. Because it's been a really intense day, hasn't it? There hasn't been a break the whole day. With classes, Harinam, 
more classes and more classes. <laughs> and guess what we'll do tomorrow? More classes. <laughs> And we'll start off with Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. He's going to do his second part of his presentation for Bhagavatam class tomorrow. So that'll be there, and then there'll be some other activities during the day. So thank you very much. I'll leave you to take care of some needs that you may have to take care of. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Srila Prabhupada Ki yeah.